Hello there. This is a Televideo 950 terminal, and I'm glad I have this because uh, I don't know how easy this thing's gonna be to use. This is one of the three terminals that I got with my S100 computers that included an MSI 8080 and a CompuPro 816. Now, the thing about everything that I got in that uh, collection of hardware is that it was all quite literally <laughs> stored in a barn. So this thing is disgusting. First off, if I come up here and reach around to that, yeah, that's, uh, that's dirt, uh, which thankfully isn't mold, because uh, that's a thing, you get CRT cataracts, but it's dirt and it needs cleaned, and the likelihood is that it's all inside of it too. So uh, this is gonna be another time where I get to use my ESD safe vacuum cleaner, but that's not the main thing that I'm concerned about. What I'm really concerned about is the state of the electronics inside. I have not attempted to power this on since I've got it. It has not been plugged in, and it probably hasn't been plugged in in years. So none of the capacitors in it will be formed correctly, which is a concern to me if you've seen my video about reforming capacitors. So what I'm gonna do is today, we're gonna tear this thing apart and uh, see what it has going on inside, see if there's anything that looks obviously wrong that needs to be taken care of, and see if there are any capacitors inside that are worth reforming, because this thing first came out in 1980, and it probably has some big power supply caps inside. Let's start off by just looking at the keyboard here to get a sense of just uh, how much we have ahead of us. Those keys are actually black. Uh, I've held off on doing this, but let's wipe one off and just see. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, that's so, so much. Uh, I have a towel here. Let's just, uh, let's see what happens when, yeah. Now, since I don't want to get this thing just drenched and I don't have running water in the office anyway, we're gonna use my ESD safe vacuum cleaner to try and clean this off. So let's see how this goes. It's gonna be uh, loud and a lot of work. <laughs> Well, is it perfect? No. Is it remarkably better and something that I am not afraid to touch now? Yes. Now, my main goal here isn't to get this thing like fully museum quality, pristine clean. To do that, I really am gonna have to bring in some wet cleaning. But for right now, uh, I'm mostly focused on getting just the bulk dirt off so I don't knock it farther inside and make things worse than it is. Man, look at so much, it's just layered up in a little pile there. So yeah, we're going to be uh, using the ESD vacuum for this, just so that it's less horrible to touch. That is much, much better now. All right, now that it's clean enough that I'm less concerned about getting dirt everywhere, I was looking in the manual and it actually tells you how to disassemble it and it even recommends doing it as soon as you unpack it just to investigate it for damage. Uh, I would tend to agree with that since you're shipping a CRT and those don't handle it well. So looks like we have four screws to remove and then we can lift off the top. And uh, if I go a couple other pages in there, we can get an idea of what we're gonna see once we get that open. So that's what we're doing next. But yep, there are indeed four screws. So let's get those out. All right, so. According to the manual, we're gonna leave behind the majority of the stuff. So I should lift it from the top. And indeed it was. Oh, that's that's not encouraging looking in there. Oh. All right, getting a look inside. Um, I see dirt and clean spots, which tells me this thing's probably been rained on while it was outside, because it, it shouldn't look like that. Um, and it is exceptionally dirty. I can't even read what that chip says. It's so bad, um, and if I do that, you'll get an idea of uh, just how dirty it is there. So, fun. Um, I think what I need to do, though, is work on getting this out. It looks like there are plastic rails. Yeah, I can see right there the board is slid into some plastic rails that run along inside of the chassis. So we should be able to get this thing slid out to take a better look at it. 
All right, though, there is the board, and man, that thing is truly filthy. Man, that's a, there's a lot going on here. So we have something legible on that, probably firmware ROM. Uh, what I'm gonna do here now, though, is we're gonna clean this. This is where the ESD vacuum is really helpful because I don't have to worry about static charge or buildup here because this is conductive all the way to ground, so this thing is grounded just by touching this. So. Let's go ahead and uh, do some cleaning. That is looking dramatically better now. So that is uh, actually gonna be something we could take a look at now and try to understand what is going on here. Okay, some of these are still a little dirty, but we're at the point now where I can use uh, the wet wipes to like really clean them. So I'm gonna go ahead and wipe off the tops of all the chips with this. There we go, just light touch. That's the safe way to do it. Okay, uh, I think I have these dumped. I'm not sure that the Mini Pro uh, TL86 Plus uh, actually supports these chips, but I got a good read that had the information kind of like duplicated in them um, after getting recommended a different part by Wizard Tim. Uh, so I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that's good. We don't need that dumped, thankfully, so we're just gonna hope that that makes this work. Uh, and now we're gonna turn our attention to what is inside the chassis. Let's take a look at what is going on in the chassis. It is, it's also very dirty, um, unsurprisingly. Um, I need to be a little more careful around some stuff like the very fragile yoke here. Um, but yeah, uh, looking down into here, there is a, a gigantic transformer under there. You can see it right there. Uh, it's really difficult to see, but no large filter caps. Um, there is a line filter cap I can see in there. That's very much not Rifa and very much Weird looking, um, but that's probably not an issue. So we can ignore that for right now. Right here though, on the CRT power board, uh, we can see two chips. One of them is a little dirty to the point where I can't really read what's on there. So let me clean it quickly. All right, we have a 35 volt, 3300 UF cap and a 15 volt, 4700 UF cap. So those are a little big there, um, non-vented tops, who those would be exciting to have blow. Um, they are glued down, but I, I'm wondering if maybe we want to reform those. Let's see. Yeah, I think that might be worth doing just to make sure we don't shock it, especially, you know, it's really low voltage being 16 volts on that one for sure. So that's probably worth doing. Ah, oh, that was difficult with one hand. All right. And there we are. Oh, that's gonna be so much easier to get to. So much easier. So we have this out. Uh, you know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make myself not feel dumb and I'm gonna take a picture of where these caps go. Let's go ahead and remove these two bigger caps. Uh, this one is, why is it only 100 UF? Is it like 200 volts? It's 160 volts, holy moly. Uh, I could not reform that one even if I wanted to right now. Let's get those two off. Good. There's one. So also you can see there's no vent up there, but this little black hole right there, that's probably the vent uh, on the bottom. Please just let go. Seriously, there, finally. All right, this capacitor is now reformed. So we're gonna take that one off. Uh, that one's ready to go. And it looks very good after the test. And we're gonna put this one on. This one's 35 volts and uh, was it 3300 microfarads? Yes, yeah, so that one's pretty uh, good there. So we're gonna do this and go ahead and reform that one. This cap is reformed and while we're waiting for the other one to be finished, I'm gonna go ahead and put this back in here. This one goes on the outside at C117, negative to the outside. Um, since I've already cleaned off the contacts, it'll be real easy to get it back in there. So just gotta get some solder on it that was kind of terrible, but whatever, that'll work. All right, one down, one to go. 
All right, this capacitor just finished and uh, it was reformed with a 150 microamp current there limit. Uh, so the most leakage current they could have is 150 microamps. That one's totally fine. Which means this one can go back in now as well. And then we can fire this thing up. I think those were the same height. Yeah. All right. It's time to try it. I'm gonna take the keyboard and plug it into the connection in the back for that right in the middle. There we are, hopefully that works. Power connection is set to off. There's a bracket preventing you from uh, setting it to 230 volts. I think we're ready, so here we go. Yeah, I can't think of anything else, let's do it power and power switch beep i like beeps we gonna get video yes <laughs> oh yeah um let me look at that manual let me set it to half duplex mode yes I'm officially saying it works. <laughs> and there it is, the Televideo 950 up and running. It feels really good to just have something from the S100 lot I picked up a while ago working now and uh, gives me hope that I'm gonna be able to resuscitate everything else. Those capacitors in there seemed like they were in really good shape. So I'm hoping everything else is too as I go through it. Now though, I wanna check out some of the features and functions of this terminal because it's pretty cool. And unlike the TRS-80 DT1 that I looked at a while ago, this is, I don't know the best way to put this, a real terminal? This is a Televideo 950, unlike the TRS-80 DT1, which is either a Televideo 910, ADM3A, ADDS25, or Time 1410, and that it was a terminal emulator because it doesn't actually have its own character set. This does, because this is a ground up original terminal made by Televideo. That's enough of that though. Let's get back to actually using this thing. So the keyboard is hardwired in the chassis, which is unfortunate and ends in a uh, RJ series connector here, which plugs in upside down right there. That uh, kind of sucks as the keyboard cable there is being stretched out, but that's as good as it gets. Real odd choice to have that plug into the back like that. But back here, we also have a, a number of controls. We have S2 and S1, and these are how you configure the terminal. And if you change any of these settings, you do have to restart it. That's an advantage that the DT1 has over this. It has soft switches, so you can figure that in software rather than having to do this, and then you don't have to restart. But I do believe most of the settings can be reconfigured by the host over serial, so at least you have that option without needing to restart. On serial, we have the host port here, which is marked RS-232, and the printer port here, which is just marked printer. Now, I believe these are actually both RS-232 ports because LPT ports are usually the opposite gender, or is it serial ports? Or I think serial ports might be. I don't know. It's weird having them both be the same, but I know both of these are RS-232 because the manual tells you how to change the baud rate for the printer and the actual serial port, and you don't have to configure the baud rate for LPT. So that means that this is a serial printer output, which means I should be able to use it with my Apple image writer. So I'm going to try and give that a shot today. Then lastly, we have some other standard controls. The contrast adjustment here, a fuse, the voltage selection, which is metal band guarded to not be changed. I kind of like that. And the power switch. With that though, it's all set up. So I'll flip the switch here and we get that beep, but I will come back to that in a moment. I absolutely love the beep. But here we have the initial startup screen, the cursor in the upper left, and then this down here, which is actually known as the status line. 
Now the status line is both weird and cool and useful. Uh, at Initially, I would be concerned that it might cause burn-in, but so far I haven't seen any evidence of burn-in on this tube. So maybe it won't be too bad. Realistically, this thing is done being used daily, so it'll probably never be a problem. But it's kind of weird and cool. As I bring the cursor down, you'll see that number there starts to increment and I can get it down to 24. And if I bring it all the way over, you'll see that we can get it to 80. Now that's actually a relief in a way because another thing that I had a concern about with this was, hey, if that's using up a whole line to display text, is this still a full 80 column display? And yes, it is. It can show 80 columns by 24 columns of characters, which is what you would expect for a terminal like this. So you are giving up nothing to have it here. Now, every single one of these little sections has a different purpose. We can see that there are two here, one for dupe and one for EDTL. The dupe means that it is in duplex edit mode and the EDTL means that it is in edit line mode. The LOC here means that it's in local mode because I changed the dip switches on the back so that I could interact with this without having a host connected. The 19.2 there means that it is running at 19,200 baud for the connection. Now as I was moving the cursor keys there, you may have noticed something. Can you hear that? Have you ever looked on the bottom of a Model M and seen this? This empty speaker grill right there? Well, this has one of those too. Except this one actually has a speaker there. And one of the dip switches on the back lets you set it to beep every time you press a key. Now, would this get annoying if you were typing on this all day, every day? Probably. But do I enjoy having my terminal sound like an Atari 2600 every time I use it? Absolutely. So I'm gonna be leaving that on for the rest of this video because I absolutely love that feature and I wish more keyboards had the option to just randomly beep. Oh, that's just delightful. Well, all right, I think that's enough groundwork laid and you can probably understand how this thing is actually going to function here. So it's time to use this, which means we're bringing out Linux and we're gonna connect the terminal to that because it's just super easy to actually do that. Now, since I released the DT1 video where I did this as well, I've had a lot of questions on how I did this. So rather than focus so much on using a terminal with Linux, which I showed in that, I'm gonna show you how I use this terminal with Linux because it's not that difficult and anyone could do this, but you probably don't want to. Now, the first thing you need to get, unless you have a very exotic terminal, in which case you likely know this won't work, is a USB to serial adapter. So this takes a standard USB port, and I'm sure these come in a Type-C variant, if you're gonna insist on that, and adapts it to a DB9 or DB25 connector. Now, this one is um, easier to use, I'll say for now, because <laughs> The thing about Serial is that this is just the beginning. Serial is really a game all about adapters. And I've been collecting so many different kinds of adapters for years. Uh, yes, predominantly through Goodwill. Because the reality is, Serial is horrible and weird and not tremendously standardized and just kind of terrible. Well, it's not fair to say that it's not standardized, but it's very difficult to use when you don't know what's going on. This cable is a null modem serial cable. So this already has the RX and TX line swapped. What does null modem mean? Well, this is a null modem adapter. It takes in one gender and outputs the opposite gender. So if you plug this into a cable, like say this male connector there, you have effectively the same output, which makes it seem like it does nothing, right? Well. Serial has RX and TX lines, and th the two devices trying to communicate need to send the data to each other. But the thing is, you have to flip these because you need to send the TX from one device to the RX of the other, so when they <laughs> line up with the wiring, it actually fits. You have to get that right, or else they'll be sending the TXs into each other and the RXs into each other, and they will never communicate. So. You definitely need null modem adapters or cables in order to make sure that you can adapt to that correctly. Not all devices need a null modem adapter. Some of them have it built in. 
Probably most terminals won't though, so you'll want to keep that in mind. Next is you'll notice that there are two different sized connectors. Serial came in both 25 pin and 9 pin. 25 pin usually uses more hardware flow control. Because serial is a serial protocol, it means the data is in a single stream. That means that the host can potentially overwhelm the client by sending too much data, and both the client and the host need to be able to communicate to each other outside of the data stream whether or not they're ready to communicate. So the 25 pin version had a lot more of that in there, but they eventually realized they didn't need all of it and dropped down to nine pins, which does still have some flow control, just not as much as this overkill version did. So these are used to adapt older 25 pin adapters to nine pin stuff. Now, I do actually need one of these to connect to the terminal that I have here. Now I wish that was it, but I do need this adapter as well. Uh, gender changers were a thing for Serial because they just couldn't decide on stuff, I guess. I don't know, I don't really have a good excuse for them, but I have to use this gender changer to be able to plug this in. So we're going USB to Serial null modem to nine pin to 25 expansion to a male to male gender changer. Yeah, we have to have all of that hanging off of the back of the terminal. Now we can plug our adapter nightmare to the back of the terminal, and we can plug this end into the computer. Before we go back around to the front, let me quickly point out the dip switches back here that are used to configure the machine, because I'm gonna be talking about that in a moment, and if you try and set up a terminal with Linux, you're going to need to be aware that stuff like this is gonna to need to be changed. Okay, so we've got the terminal and we have the Linux machine. I'm gonna go ahead and connect my USB to serial adapter now, and with that, we're pretty close to ready to use this. I can turn on the terminal at this point. I would recommend doing that first before the next step, and you'll see why. But uh, we can see a couple of things here. Uh, we are now in FDX, which is full duplex mode, because I changed the dip switches on the back to make it ready to receive data. The keyboard no longer types to the screen. And then we're getting P3ER, which is an error that's basically saying, hey, I'm not getting any data from the host. We can ignore that because we haven't configured the host yet. Now, over on the Linux side, we need to use a program called Getty, or a Getty, the more recent version of it. This is the Linux system utility that allows you to open a terminal over a serial port. So we need to be able to set it up to work with the actual serial port that we have connected to a real terminal. There are other ways to do this. Um, because what I'm going to do here is just run a Getty directly. But you can set up a Getty as a systemd unit file as well, which is actually how I did it for the DT1 in that video. However, now that I have done that for that video, I can tell you, don't, don't do that. It's not worth it. If you don't have the USB device connected, you can have the system hang at boot. Then you have to go in through a different user run level and disable that systemd service. And it is a giant pain. It's not worth it. It is just... Oh, it's so bad. Doing it this way is gonna have a problem where if we try and run a sudo command on the terminal, it's gonna show up over here as well as the output from the command, but just don't run anything with sudo on the terminal, which is honestly probably not a bad idea since you shouldn't really be doing anything serious with your computer through a novelty interface. Now to set up a Getty, we do need to know our serial port, so we can't quite run that yet. On Linux, these are listed in dev under the TTY device labels. So what I'm gonna do is do star TTY. Now, there are a lot of these. This is very dumb and confusing, but on Linux, these types of adapters will usually show up as two things. One, TTY USB or TTY ACM. Now mine shows up as USB and it's USB zero because this is the only and first device plugged into here. It's possible that if you end up doing a bunch of weird stuff with this, it may change IDs to the USB one or something like that. So keep that in mind. So we're going to run a Getty and we're going to use dev TTY and USB zero as the device. Now we need a baud rate next. That is how fast the computer should communicate with the terminal. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is at 19.2. That is 19,200 baud. Now this is the fastest this terminal can go. And it's not bad at all, if you ask me. Unfortunately, I couldn't get the DT1 to work at this speed, even though it supposedly supported it, but this one is at least working with this speed. So thankfully we can do that. 
Now at the minimum, that's actually all you need to get this running. Now I could probably run this and have it work, but that's because I've already configured three other things on the terminal over here that I know that are the usual default set for Linux. And that is the data length, the parity, and the stop bits. The data length is the number of bits sent per packet to the terminal. Usually it's seven or eight, and I would recommend configuring a terminal to use eight. The parity is a checksum to make sure that the data isn't being mangled on its way to you. Generally, that's not really worried about too much, and it's most common to set it to none. And last are the stop bits, which are usually one or two, and the general standard is one. So you wanna make sure that you have eight N1 as your configuration. That is the best way to remember that, and a lot of DOS software in particular will allow you to configure things to 8N1 standard. So that's the way that it's usually easiest to configure things. I already have this set up like that, as I mentioned, so I'm good to go. All right, with all that set up, we are ready to try this out. And uh, turned out I was slightly wrong. You don't need the full path, you just need the individual device ID for your thing. So just have TTY USB, no dev needed. When you have that set up, you can just run the command and boom, the Linux prompt on the terminal to log in. Bingo, Linux on the terminal. It really is not that hard. It is unfortunately though, that bad. You can see there's some weird text here, which is a hint of how problematic this is going to be. Uh, let's start off with a simple command, ls. That just lists files in the current directory, and that looks pretty good. Nothing out of the ordinary, just that one little thing showing up there again. Now, the file listings are very simple text being printed to the screen, so we're not seeing too many issues. The thing that was on the screen when I first held up my laptop is a program called NeoFetch. And while I'm not that infatuated with this program, it should fail dramatically here, yes. Now the problem we're seeing here has to do with this variable, echo term. This is the terminal language that is used to communicate with the device. Every single terminal has different command sequences and character codes that you can send them that are unique to them when they aren't using a standard set. I complained that the TRS-80 DT1 was not an original or true terminal. However, its usage of the escape sequences from other terminals was intentional, so it could be compatible with software written for those terminals. This one needs its own terminal command language to be defined for Linux. And VT102 is not that, as much as I wish it was with how much it looks like a VT102. Now, thankfully, all is not lost here because the Televideo 950 is actually supported by Linux, but we're going to have to install something to get that support because Linux has something called term info and term cap, which are so complicated, I've almost written an entire video about those by themselves, but I never got to the point where I felt like it was really worth talking about. Now the package on at least modern Ubuntu that you need to install to make a terminal like this work is NCurses term. This is going to add the missing terminal entries to the system. And like I mentioned before, when you try and run a program with sudo, it doesn't show up on the terminal and that just popped up on my laptop. With that installed, we will check one of the subdirectories for the term info folder, specifically the T1, which will contain all of the televideo files and does have a TBI 950 entry. Now we can use another program, InfoComp here, and run TVI 950 to open that and see what it is. And we can see it is a Televideo 950 terminal term cap entry. So this is a listing that says what all of the capabilities of this terminal are, and you really need one of these to make your terminal work as well as possible. But even this is not gonna make it fully functional. But we want to be able to use this. So let's go ahead and do that. The first thing I'm gonna do here is log out, which is going to close a Getty. Yeah, I did misspell log out over there. Don't worry about it. Then we're gonna add another parameter to the a Getty line for TVI 950. This will tell a Getty to use this as our default terminal entry. And when we rerun it on the terminal now, it will have all of the escape sequence characters for this terminal as the standard ones. And it doesn't really look any different, does it? Well, let's do echo term. Huh, it is using the TVI 950 terminal entry now. Why does it still look weird? Well, let's run NeoFetch. 
That's no better, is it? Well, there is one difference. You may have seen for some of the commands I'd attempted to type them out multiple times and then failed, and that was because the backspace key was not working. It does work now. If I log out on here, rerun a Getty without the TVI 910, and type something, you'll see the backspace key does absolutely nothing, and eventually I guess it gets pretty angry about it. So, that is one difference, that is it recognizing the commands that the terminal is sending to the computer. All right, I'm logged back in again with the correct terminal settings, but why are we still getting weird characters there? Well, one thing is that this doesn't do color, but some of the color signals may still be sent by bash because it's assuming that the terminal can do that. If we run sh, we will see we, you know, let's actually get a new line here. We'll see now we don't have those because we're not sending colors as part of the shell. What this means is that the bash configuration settings are not respecting the terminal configuration settings that we have. And this is the crux of the problem. So much software doesn't actually check this value to make sure that it's sending the correct terminal escape codes, which is a shame because there's a library built into Linux to make this easier. Now we can see this exemplified by opening, say, a man page for something. This doesn't make a lot of sense. Why are there M's over here? Why are some of these highlighted and others not? Well, there's the different formatting options that are being sent to the terminal. Some of them work, some of them don't, but I don't know what the deal is with the M. Clearly, that's not correct. So what can we do? Well, we have one more option, and that is a program called Screen. Screen is a wonderful little program that has so many features, but here we are going to abuse it for one specific function that it has. We're gonna go ahead and accept all of its things, and here we are right back at a shell. This seems exactly like it was before, but you'll notice we don't have any weird things printing there. If I man a Getty again, the extra characters have all disappeared. And if we want to go for bonus points, NeoFetch now prints correctly. One of the magic features that Screen has is the ability to interpret escape codes by programs that don't actually implement them. Screen is taking the output from all of these programs and translating them into the correctly formatted escape codes for this terminal. So with that, we can actually experience Linux almost totally correctly here. I say almost, because if we go back to that man entry, you'll notice we no longer have the highlighting and underlines. For some reason, Screen seems to strip all of that out. I've seen the exact same thing on the DT1 as well. And this is one of the things that I really beat my head against while trying to fix, but I couldn't get there. Screen is very much not perfect though. You remember the backspace I was so happy to get? Yeah, that actually just moves the cursor back now. Uh, I don't know if one of the other keys is being mapped to backspace. I haven't actually tried, let's see. Delete is backspace. Oh, there's a delete key right here. I found backspace finally. Yep, that indeed works. Well, that's good, I didn't know that. Okay, whew, that's something. So yeah, the screen bindings are still a bit weird. But screen fixes so many things that it is uh, very much worth using because it makes it possible to do some cool things. All right, I'm guessing their servers are offline at the moment, but I just did this a few days ago as I was working on this terminal, and it can play the Telnet Star Wars that is available, which is very, very cool to watch on here, and it runs so much better on here than it did on the DT1. We are nearly done, but there's one more thing I still want to do. Print, because the terminal itself has a printer output, and I want to see that work with a serial printer. There's the login, and I can print it. Ah, oh, okay, that was agonizing. Uh, let's actually try this though. All right, we're gonna go ahead and jump straight into screen for this. All right, so now we're gonna CD, CD ripping, LS, LS, and we're going to vim, all right, uh, rip bin-q, okay. So this is a text file that I wrote that's a bash script for ripping CDs. Uh, and the only reason I wanted to load that is that I have a full screen of text 
just as a demo, uh, because the way this works is it's only going to print what's on the screen. It's not gonna print the file or anything, but what you can do is scroll through the whole file if you want to print the whole thing. So I can do this. Wait. No, don't tell me screen just stole that. Wait a minute, is there, can you send a command to print from the mainframe? Weird. Uh, and apparently screen overrides that. Print function programming. The terminal's printer port may be set for one of five types of communication. Extension, copy all data received by the terminals displayed and sent and sent to the printer, okay. All data sent from the computer to the terminals printed without being displayed on the screen. Interesting. So that's also cool. That means that you could uh, request a document through here and then it's just printed straight to the printer. So it'd be like a non-screen option. That's, uh, huh. Yeah, and you have to send it different escape sequences. Um, log out, hold on, let's log out. Log out, all right? Done, nothing, okay. I'm gonna relaunch this, okay. Print. All right, it's printing the whole screen. That's what I expected it to do. All right, now that, we're just gonna double check this term. VT102 is what our current uh, term info entry is, okay? Can I print with this? No. What? Yep, okay, I have no idea how we're gonna set this and uh, realistically, we have printed so we know it works. It's just one of those things where terminals on Linux are kind of a pain now. Well, I think we're gonna wrap it up with that. Uh, this thing is still really cool, even if utilizing it is kind of problematic. But the real thing to keep in mind is that this was just the first thing from my collection of S100 hardware that I got. And getting this working is a really good sign that I'm gonna be able to get everything else working. So I don't see this and think, oh, darn, it didn't work with Linux. I see it and I think, oh, it may work with the CompuPro. So, I still will be coming back to this later with that. And this is just one of two of these that I have. And uh, it might be fun to try and do something with two of them at once. Maybe even with Linux if I have to, oh man, learn how to code all of my own escape sequences to actually do something interesting. But it might be worth taking some time to do that. Uh, I've definitely spent a lot more time on dumber things. So something like that could just be fun to do. But that's it for now. Uh, I think we've covered enough here, gotten this up and running, and I showed you how you can connect a terminal to Linux, even if I really may not recommend it because it's kind of just an exercise in frustration. Well, if you enjoyed this video, you may want to subscribe to the channel to be notified when I release the next one. If you want to help support the channel, you can get a shirt like this one or find me on Patreon. But for now, that's it, and I will see you next time. I really wanted to do the printout with this thing, but I clearly can't.